Live, brought to you from the Eternal Word Television Studios in Birmingham, Alabama. God in his kingdom. Moved by the Spirit, one who lives in love lives in God. And God lives in him. What a wonderful thing is our church. This whole network is built on trust. The essence of evangelization is to tell everybody Jesus loves you. We are all called to be great saints. Don't miss the opportunity. Thank you. Well, we just have a great group of family here tonight, and that always makes me feel so good. There's a few things I want to talk about tonight, and I have the question of the week. We just started that a couple of weeks ago. And I started because I don't want my liberal friends to think, since I've been so nice lately, that I forgot them. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we're going to talk about lying. That's not to tell the truth to exaggerate the truth, to tell a downright lie, something that never happened, never nothing. I mean, it's just not true. But I'm going to take uh, the question of the week given to me by one of our security men. Um, and it came up to me when I was waiting for Sister Regina Uh, in the car, and she said, you know, there's something I don't understand. Now, when I get through with this, you're both not going to understand, like he doesn't understand, and you're both going to know the answer, but you're not going to understand the answer either. How do you like that? <laughs> I'm going to read this to you, and then you will see why he didn't understand. You're going to know the answer, but you won't know the answer. And here it is. A woman is charged with fetus gun death. You probably read it, but I wanted to comment on it. So his question is, I don't understand. A woman who claimed she didn't have enough money for an abortion was charged with murder for allegedly killing her six-month-old fetus by shooting herself in the womb. Now, the baby girl was delivered March 27th by emergency cesarean section after after she was shot in the wrist. After a week, her undeveloped kidneys began to fail. Her body filled with water and she died. Her mother was charged Wednesday with third degree murder and manslaughter. Isn't that the strangest thing you ever heard? Um, that's interesting here. See, they have, you know, these politically correct words. Did you ever see that? Yeah. I think it's a bunch of garbage. Say what you mean, for goodness sakes, you know. But let me see how clever they are. It says fetus twice. A six-month-old fetus. 
in the very next sec sentence, it said the baby girl was delivered. Isn't it strange when they want an excuse for murdering a baby, they call it a fetus. All the time they know it's a boy or a girl. <sighs> you know what's strange about it? I think that's where our guard has a problem. Every every hour, every minute of every hour, a baby is aborted, almost every second, brutally aborted. Arms and legs cut off and saline solution inserted and burned to death. in the womb. Did you notice this is in the womb? This woman shoots herself, meaning to kill her own baby. And it's manslaughter and first degree, third degree murder. Isn't it strange if a doctor does it in a nice clean uh, room, clinic, it's the law. Was it because she didn't have money and some doctor was deprived of four or $500? Now, if she would have killed that baby after it was born, you could say, well, that's murder for sure. But she killed it in the womb like it's happening every city, every day, every day, every minute, every hour for years and years and years and years. It's a fetus. After it's delivered or murdered, it's a girl. What's your answer? Do you have one? Do you have one for this kind of reasoning? Should the woman be tried? Oh yeah, but so should every doctor and every nurse who was much worse than that. So I, I just wanted to bring it up to you to see how nonsensical the enemy is. The enemy. And when he leads you to do things, and the big lie, you see, that she's been told, and all the women who've had abortion has been told, the big lie is you have a right to choose. This woman chose. She's up for manslaughter and murder. For a measly $500, you can walk away not guilty. Now, isn't that the strangest thing, huh? What is the answer to Joe's question? The answer is it is Satan. The great deceiver. The great deceiver. I told you about the women. Every week, every week, I get a, a letter from some woman who has had an abortion and the torture she's going through. And inevitably, they say the same thing. I bought the lie. I bought the lie. Well, People who commit suicide buy a lie. People who think they're going to get out of suffering and have assisted suicide have bought a lie. When you, when you go against the church and when you say there is no sin, you tell a lie. When you speak ill of your neighbor and slander them, and tell some secret of their life that nobody ever knew, you slander. And although it may be the truth, at that point it becomes slander. And today the greatest sin in the world, and there are a lot of great sins in the world today, 
is calumny, to calumniate somebody, to say something terrible about them that is not true. And that way you ruin their reputation. You, you ruin their credibility. And no matter how much you may make up or restore afterwards, there's always somebody somewhere who believes that lie you told. And today it seems to be so much a part of the fabric of the world that people don't even know when they tell a lie. Children know. They know. Like the man, uh, the, the young woman who didn't want to see the person coming up her, her uh, walkway, so she tells her son, when the doorbell rings, it's going to be Jenny. Tell her I'm not home. It's okay. So the bell rings and he opens the door. He says, my mother tell, said to tell you she's not home. <laughs> he hadn't learned how to tell a lie. Blessed child. Rash judgment is a lie. Oh, we do that a lot. Who do we all do that? We all do that. Somebody does something. I know why you did it. How do you know why he did it? You can't say why he did it. I know why he's angry. Why? You know, I know uh, two women, one woman, they were very, 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 very good friends. And uh, one woman had an abscess tooth, real swollen. And she went to the doctor, and he couldn't, the dentist rather, he couldn't do much with it, so she had to go home and take an antibiotic. And she's walking down the sidewalk, and she's holding her chin and just kind of, you know, half crying. And, and all of a sudden, her best, best, best friend passes by, and she doesn't even notice her. When she gets home, the phone rings, and does she lay her out? I knew you never liked me. I passed you by, you didn't even look at me. Huh? I didn't see you. That's a lie. I tell you. You look right at me. I didn't see you. Well, after supper, the kids from the one who had the toothache and the kids from the one who was upset, rash, judged, were at it, tooth and nail. In a matter of 12 hours, a beautiful friendship was destroyed over rash judgment. See, that means I put a motive on somebody's action that I, I'm way off base. Way off base. See, I want to read you something from the scriptures and from the catechism. And I, I, I'm open for questions anytime. But we need to settle this lying business. And they say white lies. There's no more white lie than there's a white devil. <laughs> there are no white devils. A white lie, you know. White, de de you know, you clothe some kind of purity of mind or heart, and it is a white lie. It means a little one. What is a little one? If you lie, you lie. Well, our Lord had something to say about lying, if I can find it here. And here it is. He was talking to the uh, Pharisees. And he said, the devil is your father. Ooh. And you prefer to do what your father wants. He was a murderer, oh, from the start. He was never grounded in truth. There is no truth in him at all. And when he lies, he's drawing on his own store. 
because he is the liar and the father of lies. But I speak the truth. Did you realize, my dear family, that if we observe this one thing, and how much do you listen to the devil? To the, I will listen to the devil. I don't even belong. I don't even believe he's here. Woo! Number one lie. Now <laughs> <laughs> so I got news for you. The one that tells you he's not alive and not well and there is no hell lies. They're like their father who was a liar from the beginning. And what is this murderer business? Satan never, he can't kill anybody, he's a spirit. He was a murderer from the start. What does it mean that Satan, Lucifer, the ex-angel of light, was a murderer? Because he killed in one third of the angels in heaven the blessedness of the sight of God. He killed that. And from then on, they will be for all eternity the most hideous in looks, the most miserable, the most tormented. See how he was a murderer? Do you understand that? If you lose your house and your home and your job and you have your love for God, you are rich. Well, the world may consider you poor. Never allow the enemy to murder your soul. It will never die, but when it's dead, it shall be in that nether world from which there is no return. And anybody that says to you, there is no hell, eat, drink, and be merry, is a liar. And as our Lord said, you're a liar. They're like their father. Oh, let's sit another little passage here. St. Paul says in 1 Corinthians, we must get rid of the old yeast of evil and wickedness and have only the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Well, now lest you think this is Angelica's little head giving you her opinion, I got this wonderful book here called A Catechism. Ah, now some say this isn't the right teaching of the church. I thought they're liars. <laughs> St. John says something interesting. I hope I have time to show it to you. Very interesting. He says in his epistle, he who says there is no sin calls God a liar. Oh, no. If you say there are no Ten Commandments, if you say adultery is right, if you say abortion is a choice of a mother, you lie. Whoever buys your lie endangers his soul. See? I got to tell you the truth. You know, I can't go around making you feel good. I want you to be in heaven. I don't care if you feel good about it or not. <laughs> it's best you don't feel good now and you get to heaven than to go around believing all these lies and end up it's a real hot place, I can tell you. <laughs> a lie consists in speaking a falsehood with the intention of deceiving. Lying is the most direct offense against truth. When they tell you there's no immaculate conception, there is no assumption, there is no Eucharist, there is no resurrection, they, they lie. They lie. To lie is to speak or act against the truth in order to lead someone into error. Someone who has the right to know the truth. 
he, as a Catholic, you have rights. You know what I'm so happy about? I think our Catholics are finally beginning to get off of their seats. <laughs> That was close. <laughs> and begin to object. They did that at the Cairo conference. And they took out. They took out about abortion being a part of family planning. That it isn't even considered. Raise hell. Tell the truth and fight for the truth and we can turn this lying world back where it was. Not where it was, there's no past with God, where it is. But if we continue to listen to lies, then we ourselves become a liar. Everybody knows a liar. You're the only one that don't know they know. You walk away thinking you did it. And they are looking back at you and saying, that's the biggest whopper I ever heard. <laughs> You're not, your eyes tell it. You ever notice? Eyes go kind of, whoops. Excuse me. Oh well. When you lie, eyes get shifty. You know where shifty is? They kind of go back and forth. Just go back and forth. And then they look down. They can't look you in the eye because they're lying. So they look down, they look up, they look this way, they look that way. The gravity of a lie is measured against the nature of the truth it deforms. The circumstances, the intentions of the one who lies, and the harm suffered by the victims. How many times has a lie destroyed a family, a home, a person's credibility, identity, just total destruction? And even when it's healed, it's always somehow there. That's great. And to say, oh, that's nothing, you don't need to confess that, is a lie. By its very nature, lying is to be condemned. It's a profanation of speech. The reason we speak is to communicate truth. The reason religious or priests or brothers are, are taught and educated is to speak the truth. If they don't speak the truth, then they lie. So you can't have a little bit of truth and a little, well, yeah, the devil does that. A little bit of deception, a big amount of deception, a little bit of truth. Dangerous. Now. Every offense committed against justice and truth needs reparation. Even if its author has been forgiven. It's like the man who stole a lot of lumber. A lot. So he goes to confession. And... Uh, He's already moved to another state and he brought the lumber with him. So the priest said, well, you must restore the lumber. He says, oh, I can't, Father. So there, he gets his uh, uh, absolution and, and they begin to kind of little chit-chat and Father says, oh, by the way, he said, uh, priest, pray that we can build on to our church and school Oh, okay, I got a lot of lumber. <laughs> I 
<laughs> there's no restoration. See, no even a thought of restoration. When it is impossible publicly to make reparation for a wrong, it must be done secretly. If someone who has suffered harm cannot be directly compensated, he must be given moral satisfaction in the name of charity. This duty of reparation concerns offenses against another's reputation. If you ruin somebody's <coughs> reputation or you say a lie, then you have to go back and say, I lied about this person. They didn't do that. You say, well, I can't humiliate myself. Well, what did you do to this poor person? You wonder now, how would this woman or any woman repair or have restitution for an abortion? You do by asking God to forgive you. Never doing it again and never encouraging anyone. Go out and ask people, tell them, please don't do this. It's unbelievable pain that you never forget. See? Adopt an unwanted baby. There's many ways that you can make restitution. The duty of rep reparation concerns of offenses. The reparation, moral and sometimes material, has to be evaluated by the damage done. You just can't say, well, I won't do that again. You've got to restore. So you've got to restore. And remember every time, you know Bishop Sheen, God bless him, he said something I think is very good. He said, he who throws mud loses his own ground. Think of that. He who throws mud loses his own ground. See? If we were to begin to build each other up. But a what a change it would be in this world. We have a call. Hello? Hello, Mother. Hi, where are you from? Louisiana. And what is your question? Well, it's not really a question. Uh, God bless you. I hope to meet you in heaven. Um, but I understand that not only if you are pregnant, when you go into these abortion clinics, even if you are not, they will tell you that, that you are and still do the procedure. They're so money hungry. Also, I believe that the, the women that are so against uh, life are do so because they have uh, experienced an abortion. The statistics show now one in every ten American women either have had an abortion or will have an abortion. Mm. Well... That's the, the, the mentality of the world, is to lie. See, to lie. I read an article about China. In one particular city, they uh, have the solution for, a bo for population uh, uh, explosion, which is nonsense. And their solution is work the women hard and long hours. They didn't need abortions. There were no children in that, in that city for years. Can you imagine the lack of appreciation for the dignity of a woman that you work her to death? I think it should be the opposite, work the men to death. <laughs> How many for that? <laughs> Can you imagine the, the reasoning that I, I worked this woman so hard that she's dead at night? She said, you don't have any, that's a lie. You can't. There has never been a time in history when the dignity of women has been so degraded. And they talk about safe abortion. 
Yeah, did you hear what I just said? I heard it a hundred times at, the, at this conference. Safe abortion. Who's it safe for? <laughs> Not the baby. Safe. Can you imagine anyone using those two words and putting them together? Safe and abortion. And how many they don't tell you about have not been safe for mother or child. <sighs> you know what I think? You want to know what I think? I'll tell you anyway. <laughs> I think that in heaven, there is a special place for aborted children because they're martyrs to the morals of the church. Most martyrs are, are die for the faith. Maria Greta didn't die for the faith. She died because she would not allow this man to rape her and so she was uh, uh, stabbed 14 times and she died that she's considered a martyr. Well, what's the difference with these poor kids? You know what I also think? I think they're praying for their mothers. Because where they are, they don't have hatred or selfishness. that their mothers and the whole world, every mother, every woman has, has some sense, spiritual sense, and knows she does not have the right to choose another person's life. Nobody has a right to choose whether a woman or a boy or a girl lives or dies. Nobody has that right. And that's the great lie. And we must, in our daily life, not be accustomed to these. And that's why I'm so happy. Those pro-lifers there, they fought and fought and fought. And will it change things? I think it could. I think all these people who have all these bright ideas walked in there absolutely sure that the silent majority would remain silent. I'm not for that. It's time the silent majority become very verbal. Because every time you are, it works. You stem and stop the tide of lies, untruth, uh, and immorality, all the things that happen in the world that we're taking for granted now. Somebody said on the air a few days ago, well, the world has changed. You just have to get accustomed to abortion. When that day comes, when everybody is accustomed to abortion, then we've lost it all. And for one, I do not believe that we will ever get accustomed to abortion. So you see, the, the fiber of, of the world is by the lie, as long as it makes you happy. Well, according to this good book and this good book, two good books, it's a lie. We have a call. Hello? Hi. Hi. How old are you? Six. You're six. Wonderful. And what is your question? Um, is it okay to tell a lie if you don't want to hurt somebody's feelings? I didn't get the question. Huh? Is it okay to tell a lie if you don't want to hurt somebody's feelings? No, honey, I'm afraid it isn't. Um, you see, you hurt God. You always hurt when you tell a lie. See? There's no, there's no such way of not hurting someone. 
uh, sometimes we, it's the way we say something. And the way you say something is, is very important. But you cannot tell a lie and harm your own soul not in order not to hurt uh, someone else. That's what we call a white lie. There is no such thing as a white lie. There's a gravity of a lie, you know. If you lie about someone and they lose their business, they lose their rep, that's pretty grave, you see. But um, if you tell a lie that we say is a small lie, see, when, we, when we're so concerned about white lies, it means we lie. <laughs> and our conscience is bothering us, see. So we want mother to say, oh, it's okay. It's not okay. To lie is a venial sin. For example, if you slap somebody that's brave, I mean, it's terrible, it's an insult. If you break their arm, leg, and give them a black eye, that's worse. Would we not say that? But haven't you offended the person either way? But then we can't say that I offend less if I just sock you once. <laughs> Does that make sense to you? I could have shocked you 20 times. Well, one is enough. You still offend. Do you see what I'm saying? And sometimes we, we teach our children to lie. You don't even know you do that. Tell your daddy you think that mama needs a new dress. That poor kid doesn't even know what you're wearing. But you've taught him already to say something that's really not true, see? We have a call, hello? Yes, good evening, Mother. Yeah, What's uh, your, where are you from? I'm from Virginia. What's your question? It's not a question, it's just a comment. Uh, almost 20 years ago, I had made the decision to have an abortion. And as a part-time profession, so to speak, I was a trained uh, emergency medical technician. The Lord does things in many funny ways, but after I found out I was pregnant and had made the decision to have an abortion, within two weeks, I personally had to deliver the fetus of a, a four and a half month fetus on a 14 year old girl. Uh, and that made me change my mind. That yeah. child today is very close to me much more so than my three other children. And um, that's the only thing I wanted to say. Well, well that's wonderful, Sriar, because, uh, you see, that's a great witness for maybe somebody here. See, that the, the word fetus it, it kind of uh, takes away the dignity of a child. You see, that's a human being. It's not a, a, a glob of blood or whatever. It's it's a it's already formed. It has a heart and it's beating and see this is so that's the lie. And when they say, Well now you're a woman and you have the power to choose, that's a lie. Because you're not choosing for yourself, you're choosing for somebody else, you see? That's that's where the lie is. I saw a debate between some nun sister, whatever, uh, <laughs> and uh, Father Rutler on crossfire, because I couldn't understand half of it, because everybody's yelling at each other. I don't get that. But anyway, if you listen to the one you wanted to listen to, you got the gist of it. But the, she didn't make any sense. She, she says that uh, the Vatican only is against abortion because they don't want women to have power. What does that mean? 
Now, see, that's to call the whole Vatican, the Holy Father, the whole Church, the Magisterium, a liar. See, we, we need to be so careful that, that see, that's not why. We're defending a, a, a child, a boy or a girl. And this article was so clever. Wasn't that clever? It was a fetus in the first article, in the first line. And then, she killed her six-month-old fetus, but the baby girl, isn't it a shame we have to call it a girl or boy only after we've mutilated them? You see the big lie? We have bought a lie. We have a call. Hello? Hello. Where are you from? Omaha, Nebraska. Okay. Where you, what, what's your question? Mother, I would like your opinion on abortion in cases of rape or incest. Rape and incest are tragedies. St. Paul has a lot to say about incest. There's a lot of it going on. Brothers with sisters, fathers with daughters, uncles with nieces. It, it's horrible. Horrible, horrible, horrible. Rape the same. But you can't have an abortion. You can't do that. I think I told you the story of um, a man who went into this college and gave a, a talk on on um, abortion, the needs, the needs for abortion. And this one man got up and he said, uh, may I ask you a question? He said, yes. He said um, a woman had uh, 10, 11 children and the father had syphilis. Uh, some were born without hair, most of them deformed. Uh, and she's pregnant with her, I think it was 15. And all the children were very, very affected, couldn't see, couldn't hear, couldn't walk because the father had syphilis. He said, now the 15th is, uh, is on the way. What, what is your opinion? He said, abortion, of course. He said, then you would have aborted Beethoven. See? They say from these traumas that babies are so often born with various problems. But we can't make those decisions. You can't fight a tragedy with another tragedy. You can't fight a lie with another lie. You see, it, you can't. You know, everybody tells me if you put salt on grapefruit, it tastes better. You don't taste the salt, and you don't taste the grapefruit. You see, I I don't understand that. See, if you want a grapefruit, it's sour. Eat it. Put sugar on it, for goodness' sake. Don't tell me if you put salt on it, it tastes better. Well, that's how it is with lying and abortion, and all. we we just make one tragedy, one mistake, we make a greater one for an adultery or a, a premarital sex and you get pregnant, then you're now you're going to commit murder. And, and see, it looks good, it looks right when you say incest and, uh, and uh, uh, rape. Most lies look good. That's why you fall. For example, if you bought a new car and you ran it uh, 20,000 miles and you somehow put back the speedometer to uh, 1,000 miles, and you sell it for a higher price, I'll make a bet. A lot of you don't see the point. Let me give you something so small that you're going to think, Mother, you are picky. Okay, I am picky. 
I'll tell you I'm picky. But it shows an attitude of mind that when you start doing little things, and that is the good old postage stamp. You know what I'm going to say, don't you? <laughs> huh? Because you probably did it. You get a letter in the mail and somehow it slipped the stamp. <laughs> you blow on it and you go... <sighs> <sighs> you start to peel it off. Your reasoning, oh, here it comes. I know, you've, you've either thought about it or you've done it. <laughs> Your reasoning is, well, it's a brand new stamp. <laughs> well, there's not a question it's a brand new stamp. But my friend, it costs 29 cents to send a letter from California to Saginaw. It also cost 29 cents from Los Angeles to San Diego. Now if your envelope happens to come and you peel it off and use it on another stamp, you're lying because it implies you bought the stamp. You didn't buy the stamp. You stole it. And you don't care. I hate that post office anyway. They're always raising the price. <laughs> they don't say anything to me when I get a letter that's all crumbled. So what's the difference if I steal their old stamps? Uh-huh. You there? Something happens here. A woman told me, she was uh, talking to me about something else and on the phone and she said, oh, and she started laughing, ha, 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 so cute. She said, I thought it was so funny today, my son stole a candy bar in the grocery store. I said, hey, what? You stole a bar of candy in the grocery store. I said, when did you see it? When he got home. Did you make him take it back? No, he ate it. I said, now you taught him to be a thief. Oh, he's just a kid. I said, I remember what I did when I was three years old. You see how we excuse all these kind of things in our life. And we can't. We have a call from a person who needs prayer for a friend who is in the hospital dying from third miscarriage. If that woman dies because she was going to have a child, she'll die a martyr's death because she wants so bad to keep it. Let's say a prayer. Lord God, you know how many, Lord, how many have children and have the ability to bear and they do not want them. In fact, they kill them. How many, Lord, want children with all their heart and they do not have them? And we do not understand your ways. We do not under, always understand your permitting or your ordaining will. But we are finite. We are without real knowledge. We are without faith and understanding. And so, Lord, grant that this woman may survive and one day bear in her arms the child she wants so much. You are the great and holy one. There is no one like unto thee. Extend your hand and heal her. In the name of Jesus and through the intercession of Mary, 
the one closest to thee. Amen. Now, we have a call. Hello? Yes, I'm uh, Susan. May you speak a little louder, please? Yes, this is Susan Verbeck from uh -huh. Westbury, New York. And um, I'm, I was calling about my friend who had the uh, miscarriage. So I, that, I was calling about uh, having prayers for her. She's part oh, of our okay. mother's prayer group. And um, she has three children, and the family's just having a hard time with it. Um, okay. And uh, so I'm glad that everyone's praying for her now. We will pray. We did. And the Lord always hears our prayer. That's the beautiful thing about God. In fact, you know, He hears our thoughts. Well, some of you are not too happy about that. <laughs> but He does. I told you that about my Jubilee. Uh, I like yellow roses. I like ones especially that are two-tone. You know, two-tone roses? They're one color inside, and they got a little orange or red, whatever. But I got, oh, I don't know, 200 or so of uh, yellow roses. But nobody knew I liked yellow. But they all send yellow roses. And yesterday, I got another big bouquet of, of assorted yellow flowers. And, and, and the, 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 the card said, I'm sure by this time all your yellow roses are gone. Happy Jubilee. There was a big box of big yellow, all kinds of flowers. But see, I never prayed for it. I never asked for it. I just like them. Like cherry pie or... <laughs> Watch me get 20 cherry pies to buy. <laughs> which I would not complain about. <laughs> we have another call. Hello? Hello, Mother. This is uh, Emmanuel. I'm calling uh, from uh, Evergreen What's your Park. question? I'm near Chicago, Illinois. Mm -hmm. uh, my question is, first of all, I wanted to say thank you because watching your program and watching all the programs on EWTN has brought me and my friends a lot closer to my faith, my thank Catholicism. You, That's um, my question is really a hypothetical. It involves uh, martyr, being a martyr. Um, if you were faced in a situation where, let's say, someone put a gun to your head and they wanted you to renounce your faith in front of everyone and they said they would kill you if um, you did not renounce your faith or uh, they asked you the question, if you don't renounce your faith, we will kill one of your loved ones, such like your wife or a sibling or that. My question is, in that situation, I understand that you have to be in a group the graces of God, but I also know that I've talked to a few priests who said that, well, that's duress. Now, a it's friend what? of mine, duress, they said it was duress, meaning that... So, you they get, give you uh, permission to lie? Right, that's my point. Now, my point is is that a friend of mine, his name is Danny, he always told me that, uh, he, he talked about in Japan, all the martyrs there, and how even during World War II, they asked a lot of the American soldiers there to renounce their faith. And if they did, they were shot. Um, many stories concerning that, but uh, I guess so. I, you should never renounce your faith ever. In any well, you can go back to the Old Testament and see the the seven sons of the, the Maccabees and the mother with the last to die, and she kept encouraging, "Don't renounce your faith. Don't disgrace me." That was the Old Testament. You cannot refrain. If somebody put a gun to your head and say, renounce your faith, I would say, Jesus is Lord. What a way to get out of purgatory. <laughs> <laughs> you know how long it is to become a saint? Huh? You got it. You, there is no, ever, no excuse to renounce your faith. The, the, the mother of the Maccabees had seven children and all seven died and she was the last. She didn't think it was terrible. Yeah, it's terrible in as much as you don't want to see one of your loved ones die, but to have a martyr for the faith in your own family, what a grace, huh? I'm sorry, that is not right. 
What do you think all the people in uh, uh, eating up by lions? You call that Durettes? <laughs> huh? Yeah, you're sitting up there and they got uh, some kind of uh, wool uh, on you so that uh, you smell like a lamb to these lions. And uh, you don't call that Durettes? You think they were standing They Come on, y'all come. Y'all come. <laughs> They're shaking in their boots. You see these big lions coming at your jaws that they haven't eaten for two weeks? Here, yeah, you have the rats. We call them martyrs. Everything is the rats today. That's why we compromise truth. I'm under the rats. Yeah, you're the rats, but you can have the rats in hell forever. What do you think they got down there? You can't renounce your faith. You can't say, well, I can't speak the truth now because if I do, I'm going to make so and so unhappy. Oh. Very bad. St. Paul knew he was a marked man. St. Peter knew he was a marked man. And when he tried to escape, well, he wasn't escaping. He was. Everybody told him, Peter, we need you. You're the prince of the apostles. And what will happen when you're gone? And leave Rome. They're after you. So he started walking down the road. And all of a sudden, he saw Jesus coming towards him. And he said, Lord, quo vadis? Where are you going? And the Lord looked at him. He said, I go to Rome to be crucified again. And then he disappeared. And Peter turned around. He went back to Rome. They captured him. And he said, I am not worthy to die as the master since I denied him. Place my cross upside down. The rest, you're right. God bless you. <laughs>